Hello and welcome to tonight's program, Our Neighborhoods at Risk, Flooding and Drought. We felt we had two choices when choosing the conditions for tonight's program, heavy rain or heat. We chose heat and we thank you for your resiliency in coming out this evening. We did have about 75 people registered, so you are the stalwarts in our community. My name is Heather Lipp. I'm a member of Storm Surge. Tonight's program is the second of our series aimed to discuss the issues, ideas, and action steps detailed in the city's resiliency plan. Join us here on July 27 for our next program, Clean Water at Risk, Let's Save It. Our speaker will be Newburyport City Engineer, John Eric White. On a technical note, we have tried several combinations of projectors, screens, and canopy to allow for the use of slides during our program. We may know that it may be a little tough to see the slides and have provided a handout of some of the most technical. You may also come up after tonight's presentation for a closer look at the slides on the screen. And tomorrow morning, we will plan to send both presentations to all registered attendees. Dr. Stephen Young is a former chair of the Department of Geography at Salem State University where he uses remote sensing satellite imaging to analyze climate change and deforestation. He received a BA in environmental studies from the University of Vermont, a master's degree in environmental science from Yale University, and his PhD in geography from Clark University. His geographic areas of expertise include Northeastern North America and China. Wayne Castingway has been an Ipswich River advocate since childhood, prior to becoming executive director of the Ipswich River Watershed Association in September 2012. He worked for the trustees of reservations for 14 years as regional ecologist, Appleton Farms general manager, and director of the statewide agriculture program. When Stephen and Wayne finish, we will open up for a few additional comments and Q&A with our panel, which also includes city engineer John Eric White and resident Bill Mullen, a retired Army Corps Riverine specialist. We have a microphone set up so that you can ask our panel questions. Before I turn the evening over to Dr. Stephen Young, I would like to commend the city's parks department and storm surge volunteers, Newburyport Ex Extinction Rebellion volunteers for their help making these programs possible. Well, hi. Um, you're making me feel a little bit at home with, with like a classroom where everybody's kind of far away from me. Uh, I, I, um, I teach a, uh, a full semester class on the science of climate change, and I still think I haven't gotten it all across. So I've got 25 minutes tonight, and I'm going to try to to tell you more of the essence of, of what's happening, and specifically uh, what's happening with our warming world and our rising seas and our vulnerability uh, to sea level rise. And um, I have a couple graphs at the beginning that I might end up uh, showing more detail uh, at the end. Oh, I can see it a little bit. Um, but what, what, I, what I wanted to show you first is, is um, on, the, on, the, on the bottom are decades. And what I, what I recently did is there's 44 weather stations in New England. And they record the weather every day. They record the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, average temperature. And so I collected the data from 44 weather stations back to 1900 and uh, took the daily averages and made monthly averages and then took monthly averages and made yearly averages and then took yearly averages and made decade averages. And then I've mapped out how temperature has been changing in New England by decade. And the reason why I did decades is because that captures long term change. The monthly data, the yearly data, that shows, shows a lot more variability. The, the, the decade data shows um, long-term change. So the bottom axis is decades. The left-hand axis, which is in that, in that red square, or square uh, is degrees Celsius of change. And in science, we use Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Uh, zero degrees Celsius water freezes, 100 degrees Celsius water boils. Um, 
So here's the graph, and I'm going to go up, and I'm going to I'm going to show you. I guess this isn't going to come with me. I'm going to yell. So here are here are the decades. Here is change in temperature by degrees Celsius. 19 the 1900s, the teens, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000, the 2010s. And you can see a pattern. You can see there's three. There's been three main uh, changes in temperature for New England. Early on, we had a rising temperature from from the, the from the uh, beginning of the 1900s to the 1950s. Then it cooled from the 50s into the 60s. During that period, there was a lot of air pollution. There were a lot of what we call aerosols, particles in the atmosphere that reflected sunlight back to space, and so we didn't heat up as much. We actually cooled. And then when we cleaned up our air, uh, we've been we've been rising ever since. And I, I got a circle here on 1980s because it was in the 1980s that the scientific community said we're absolutely sure the world's warming. It's because of, of, of greenhouse gases. And if we don't do anything about it, the world's going to continue to warm. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Now I've got, I've got this circle. This is 1.5 degrees Celsius. We have warmed up until this decade. We've warmed almost two degrees Celsius in New England. So there's an organization of, of um, international scientists, the IPCC, and they look at look at what other scientists are doing, and they come up with with predictions of what we need to do. And, and they say the world should not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius warming since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. New England has blown past that. We're almost two degrees warmer. Warmer. Uh, the rest of the world is uh, the whole world is about one degree right now. Uh, the Gulf of Maine has been heating up more than 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 most other than almost 90 percent of other water bodies on Earth. Um, we're we're living in an area that that's warming up. One last interesting thing is uh, well maybe there'll be more interesting things but. Um, this, this line is that average line that I, that I showed you. This line down here is change in, in maximum temperatures, and here is change in minimum temperatures. So what's been happening in New England since the 1980s is, the, is it's, the, it's not getting as cold as it used to get. It is getting a little hotter, right? We, we know it's getting a little bit hotter, that maximum is increasing. But what we don't really know is that it, it, the minimums are, it's not as cold as it used to be. And, and a lot of the reason why we don't know that our world is warming as much as it is, is because it's those minimums that are really, that are really increasing the temperature on Earth. And, and when I looked at the seasons, I also, I also looked at, at the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. The winter is warming up more than twice as fast as the other seasons. Uh, it's not getting as cold as it used to be. Uh, when I used to give these lectures back in the late 1990s, the old folk in Salem would tell me they used to go skating in Salem Harbor uh, during the winter time because it got so cold for, for the ocean water to freeze in the harbor. Um, so that's one important point I want you to leave with today is that, is that um, we're, we are warming and it's those minimum temperatures uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that are really going up there. Here's the culprit, right? Uh, the main culprit right now are greenhouse gases. And um, this is, I, I grabbed this. This is June 2021, the most recent uh, reading of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And, and we, just, we just keep putting it up there. And that is, the, the, the atmospheric carbon dioxide is the, is the thermostat of our atmosphere. And it stops, it stops the Earth's radiation from, or stops some of the Earth's radiation from leaving. We still get just as much sunlight. We're just slowing down how much energy leaves the Earth. And that energy that's, that's being left over is being mostly absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are absorbing more than 90% of that excess heat. That's another reason why we don't feel it. We don't, we don't live in the ocean. We live in, we live in the atmosphere. Um, This says, this says climate change has only just begun. 
we really, if, if, if you look at long-term climate, we've been relatively stable for thousands of years. It's some decades are warmer, some are colder, but we, we generally come back to the same. We no longer do that. We've, 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 we've hit an inflection point, and now we're just gonna continue to warm. The climate that we have this year, it's not gonna be around in five years. It's gonna be a warmer world. That's not gonna be around in the next five years. We have to, we have to, what, one reason why we write resiliency plans is because we now have to change from, from uh, building infrastructure based on a stable climate to one that's got changes associated with it. Um, yeah, stable climate to unstable climate. So some of the things, right, that, 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 that the warmer world is doing it's, it's bringing uh, more variability to precipitation. We're getting really, really heavy rainfalls, more than we did in the past. And a lot of that rain runs off. Uh, the, the, the Gulf of Maine has more silt in it now than it used to because of that, that heavy rainfall does a fair bit of erosion and brings that silt in, into, the, into, the, into the ocean. Um, and I think Wayne will, will probably talk about some precipitation patterns that, that we are having here maybe. Um, also, drought. With hotter temperatures, there's more evaporation going on. And there's also, also more uh, variation going on. So we can have a number of years of wet years and then go through a period of many dry years. Um, and certain places on Earth, like the U.S. Southwest, is drying out. They are going to continually uh, to dry out. Um, and, and you must have read it in the paper, right? All the things, Lake Mead's going down a lot and the, mat, the temperatures that are there. The Middle East is another area that is, that is drying out and, and, and it's not unusual to ha hit 130 degrees Fahrenheit in parts of Iraq now. Um, and so, so, so temperatures are gonna get warmer. There's gonna, be, there's gonna be more variability in precipitation. There's gonna be more storm activity, more intense storm activity. Um, more heat waves, right now for the Boston Globe talked about, about how we used to have four days of, of over 90 degree temperature and we're already, I don't know, day six or something of, of, of this year. Um, less snow cover. I also use satellite imagery and I study, I study snow cover and it's quickly disappearing in Northeast North America. And the, the bummer about that is not just that you can't cross country ski as much, but the sun doesn't reflect as much, and it get, the energy is getting absorbed instead of reflecting back to space. And that's really happening up in Quebec, north of us. In June, Quebec is usually still covered in snow when the sun's at the highest angle. But now, uh, Quebec is, 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 is losing that snow, and that sun angle is, is being absorbed. So there are these other things that are kicking in in addition to um, um, the greenhouse gases. Another thing that's happening is there are mass migrations going on right now. Out in the ocean, uh, plants and animals are, are moving to new areas. Um, on land, uh, uh, if you believe it or not, trees migrate, right? They, they send out their seeds, and we know of species that have been moving, moving back north up again. We, we can take, we can take um, pollen samples from bogs, and we've, we've seen how, how forests and ecosystems have moved in the past, and that's happening again now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. For us here, we're this coastal community, which is beautiful. One thing that's happening, and which I'm going to talk about now, is sea level rise. When the oceans warm up, those molecules move faster and they push each other aside and water expands. And so a lot of what's happening in the world today is the seas are rising because of that thermal expansion. Also, um, the land glaciers. Almost 17% of the earth is covered in snow and ice. Um, and, and that's disappearing. A lot of, there's a lot of water locked up. Um, I don't know if you've seen images of Greenland. There's just, oh, in, in fact, uh, uh, a lot of scientists are excited to study the way that, 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 that streams develop and streams move because there's a lot of water flowing off of Greenland, flowing off of Antarctica. So that's another reason why our seas are rising. Our seas will continue to rise for at least the next 100 years or so. 
And, and, and part of the, the, the issue now is, okay, we, we know our world is warming, our world is going to continue to warm. Even if we stop putting any more carbon dioxide and methane and stuff in our atmosphere, it's still going to, the momentum, it's like having a CD in the bank, it's still going to create interest, it's still going to warm the earth for a while. But we're still putting the, the stuff up there. Um, and so the issue is, is okay, we know the seas are rising, and so some people are trying to trying to estimate when certain sea levels will occur. We know it's going to occur. We know that it's going to rise. We're not sure when. So I'm going to show you some, some and you've got some of the, the slide uh, um, uh, printouts. So what we do is we take, we take um, uh, LIDAR data. We have a plane flies overhead, and it sends down laser lights, and we know the speed of light. And so we can, we can measure how long it takes that light to go down and come back up again. And so very accurately, we can measure the elevation of the surface of the Earth. And then uh, we can take that into a computer, and then we can, can change that elevation. And so we say, OK, uh, in, in, in 10 years, it's, it's going to rise 0.73 meters. So we're going to raise that LIDAR level. And then we're going to place it on top of an air photo to show you where it actually potentially is going to going to flood. And so in, in my department, in the sustainability and geography department of the state, we're an undergraduate program and a master's program where we use those geospatial technologies to, to uh, try to uh, visualize, try to show where, where uh, a sea level rise is going to happen. This is, um, this is the whole North Shore, from Boston down here uh, up to, the, up to the, the New Hampshire line. And the, the yellows indicate that uh, this is about one foot sea level rise. These areas will be, will be inundated. The red is, is, is up to 10 feet. Ground zero on the North Shore is the Great Marsh. It, it, it's, all, it's almost all yellow here. And um, the marsh sits, sits uh, a, a lot of it uh, does not rise very high above the seas. And so um, this area is, 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 is going to experience quite a bit of, uh, of incoming, incoming water. There's still some debate about, and maybe someone out here knows, knows uh, about this, about the, so the marshes, they can, they can rise if there's enough silt coming into the, into the marsh faster than the sea levels rising. Uh, but a lot of places in the United States, the studies are indicating, like down south, uh, that the waters are rising faster than the silt for the plants. And so the, so the marshes, the salt marshes, are getting inundated. And the ecology is changing uh, from a salt marsh to, to more of an open water uh, ecosystem. And so the loss of all the, all the uh, um, um, ecological effects all the salt marsh gets diminished. Um, <laughs> you can see that, right? Um, it's it's the first one, or uh, my first or second one on your. It's, it's kind of the whole area, um, and then the blues. Number two. Um, so the blues, the blues show it at that at, at higher high tide, where the water sits. And so in a salt marsh, even though there's grass is sticking up, right, it may, it may be colored blue because that's where, that's, where, that's where the soil is. That's where the bottom of the salt marsh is. We always measure, we always measure sea level rise from higher high tide because sea level is in addition to that. And so, so those areas are going to get flooded uh, at, at that point. Here, the second one uh, shows more of, of, the, of the Merrimack and, and where we are here. Um, a lot of town here has got a little bit of time uh, before, before there's a, a, a lot of flooding. Um, you, can see, you can see the pattern, right? Um, the, 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 the marsh starts to go first, and then the edge areas start to, to get um, inundated. And so one issue is, um, in some places, marshes will migrate inland. And, and right, remember I, I, I said how, how um, 
There's a lot of migration going on in the world today. It's not just plants and animals by themselves, but whole ecosystems are moving as well. And so where we live, there's a lot of salt marsh and, and the salt marsh is, is moving. There was a, just checking my time. There was a, a, a really cool experiment at Salem State uh, from the biology department. Phragmites, which, which grows kind of in, in disturbed areas, is a little bit salt tolerant, but not, uh, not deeply salt tolerant. And so they made a, a canal to be able to go in and flood this, this uh, uh, Phragmites uh, area. And now there's no Phragmites there. That the, It's almost imperceptible in some places, uh, the rising seas. But, but now uh, the fresh water, it's an estuary, so the fresh water used to go in for the Phragmites. Now the salt water is making it in there that the, the sea level has risen, risen high enough. So we've got these, we've got these uh, movements of the marsh. And there's a lot of organizations on the North Shore uh, that are part of preserving land where, where, um, where uh, marshes are going to move to. Um, where we're at now, and I, I tell my students actually, it, it, it's a little bit of an exciting time because we are, we're, in, we're in a new situation and we need to figure out new ways of doing things and we need to figure out how to adapt to this changing world and there are a lot of ways that we can do it. And, and, I, and I know that, that Newburyport has, is on, their, on the um, uh, government, uh, knows what's going on, has, has good engineers and other people in the community, um, and, and Storm Surge um, uh, um, bringing out awareness and, and, and moving us along. At, at, at the end of the night, if it gets dark enough, I, I will show you that graph again. We, we do not have a lot of time to wait around. Um, we, it, it, uh, um, it, it, it's changing quickly here. Um, all right. Then at the end of my thing, I kind of showed an area uh, where, where uh, uh, the GIS changes uh, with each of the uh, uh, um, rising sea levels. And then um, we now have drones. And, and, and we, we're, we're working on a project in Salem where they have put uh, what's called the Living Shoreline. It used to be just this rocky beach. Uh, it wasn't very good at absorbing storm activity. It wasn't very good at, at absorbing sea level rise. So they put in this living marsh. They put in a lot of soil. Uh, they put big rocks to, to break up the, the waves. And so we've been using the drone to monitor uh, where erosion's happening in the Living Shoreline, where accretion is happening. Uh, where plants are thriving, where plants are not thriving, um, and and also with drones, we've been we've been flying uh, king tides. King tides are where we've got this extra high tide, and and to try to visualize what our future high tides will be, what our future low tides actually will be, um, by by droning those those uh, those king tides. I'm going to conclude. Um, just by saying that that um, that that our world is it it, it it's not going to go back to the climate that that, uh, that we grew up in. It's not going to come back to the climate we're in now. It it it's 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 we've been stable. It's now changing, and we can adapt to it. There's things we can do. It's going to create a lot of friction in our lives. We're gonna we're gonna have to uh, raise roads in order to get access to places. It may require uh, some uh, retreat from the coast in places. Um, there are, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's, that stuff is gonna, is going to happen. Um, but at the same time, we can, we can plan for this changing future and not be surprised by it. And uh, I'll put in one more plug at the, at down in Sam State, uh, in the Geography and Sustainability Department, we've got an undergraduate and a master's in geospatial technologies and uh, how, to use, how to use technology uh, to study the environment and climate change issues. And I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, after the talk, and uh, well, I think we'll have some, some questions and answers, and I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. My name's Wayne. Um, I got introduced earlier, and Dr. Young's a, always a hard act to follow, but I'll try, and I'll 
be relatively brief so we can hopefully have a conversation. I'm going to talk about one aspect of climate change that Dr. Young did such a great job t telling us about, really talking about heat and drought. And I'm from the Ipswich River Watershed Association, so what the heck am I doing up here in Newburyport? But um, this next slide, which you can't really see well, uh, let's see, um, that's who we are. We actually convene a partnership of watershed associations, the Parker, Ipswich, and Essex watersheds. And for those of you who don't know it, half of Newburyport, almost half, flows into the Parker River, not the, Par the Merrimack. So we actually do a lot of work up here in, in the city. And we really try to increase the resiliency of these watersheds, particularly with climate change. More recently, you've been hearing a lot more about, I would say, the the, the stepsister of the climate change conversation, and that's heat and drought. More recently, though, we've heard a lot about it. Just in the last five years, we've experienced two of the most severe droughts in our history. The drought of 2016, which was only a few years ago, was really devastated our region. Many of our towns were literally weeks away from running out of water. Think about that. We talk about storm surge, sea level rise, intense rainstorms, but what on earth would we do without fresh water? Our entire lives and society are dependent on that. Literally, the town of Ipswich, where I live, was 19 days from running out of water in 2016. So it's, it's pretty significant, and it's really increased um, the concern about our water supply resiliency up here on the North Shore. Just last year, again, the second worst drought in a long time. And just a few slides from 2016, it really devastated the Ipswich River in particular. The Ipswich River, for many of you may know this, is the most flow-stressed major river in Massachusetts. And I'll talk a little bit about that and get um, into to the climate change issue. But why are our rivers up here on the North Shore really particularly stressed due to drought? It's because we're taking too much water out of them. We use these rivers for our livelihoods, our a lifeblood of the whole North Shore are these rivers. We take a lot of water out of them. The Pie River Complex serves about half a million people every day with their daily water supply. And these are relatively small rivers. So whenever precipitation is below average, these rivers get really stressed. Also, when, with particular to the Ipswich, is 80% of the water that's withdrawn from the Ipswich River is exported outside the watershed, if you can believe that, to the bigger cities to the south. Salem, Lynn, Beverly, Peabody. And if we were to just use that water, clean it up, put it back into the ground, we wouldn't have this huge deficit. Also, as Dr. Young said, stormwater runoff is a huge problem. As we build roads, houses, buildings, factories, a lot of the water, which falls in the form of rainfall, runs off quickly into the ocean and doesn't recharge the groundwater. The groundwater is the key to keeping rivers and streams flowing in between rainstorms. These rivers, which are now going dry and what we call droughty in our world, aren't naturally that way. If we had a natural watershed, these rivers would stay flowing even during severe droughts. The biggest problem, though, is this term we call discretionary water use. The technical term is um, non-essential water use. In the Ipswich River, half, literally half the water that comes out in the summertime goes onto lawns. If we were to just conserve that water, we wouldn't have this problem. And then finally, our water regulations, both at the city, town, and particularly the state level, are woefully inadequate. They're still back in the 1900s, and they're not up to date with the climate realities of today. So we need to do a lot of improvements. Many of you probably heard in April, the Ipswich was declared, believe it or not, the Little Ipswich River on the North Shore declared one of the most endangered rivers in America, if you can believe that, because of this, this issue and this water imbalance. Uh, Senator or, or um, Representative Kerry, who actually grew up in the Ipswich River, was our spokesman and made the announcement um, a couple of months ago to bring more attention to this issue. We as an organization have responded, and I'm gonna stop all this gloom and doom and talk about what we can do. The good news is water supply resiliency and drought is one aspect of climate change we could literally fix tomorrow because water is so local. And I'm gonna tell us a little bit about some of the actions we can take to do that. But before I do that, I wanna talk about 
how government and society is reacting to these increased droughts. There's a new term in our lexicon called flash drought. Last year was called a flash drought. These droughts that come on quickly, they're really intense and they have big impacts. Um, it just doesn't rain for a few weeks and we can have these flash droughts. The 2020 drought was a good example of that. And the Commonwealth finally woke up after the 2016 drought and created, you probably can't see it that well, but the drought management plan. And they got all of the experts around the state to come up with this new plan, basically how we can be more resilient in the face of drought. They use a few indices, six indices, everything from stream flow to precipitation to fire danger to crop moisture. And they come up with a scheme to determine how severe a drought it is. And the drought in this Commonwealth are determined based on drought regions because obviously drought and weather are different across even a small state like Massachusetts. So these are the 10 regions that the Commonwealth classifies drought. And literally when we get below average precipitation, the drought task force gets together, meets monthly and declares the drought status. The new drought plan has five levels from zero to four. So from no drought to emergency drought. And basically this is what the plan calls for when you're in a one through four drought. Level one drought, which is called a mild drought, you're supposed to stop watering and reduce watering to just in the evening. Level two, outdoor watering is limited to just hoses and buckets, so a hand only. Level three and four, no outdoor watering. The problem is the drought has, plan has no teeth. All of this is completely voluntary. I spoke earlier to the fact that the regulations have not caught up. And so there's really five initiatives that we as an organization are really advocating all of the cities and towns across the North Shore take. First of all, this term called registrations. The water law in Massachusetts is so antiquated, 80% of the water withdrawals are exempt from any water conservation requirements at all. Here in New Report, you do have some conservation measures, Almost none of our cities and towns have anything, if you can believe that, even during droughts. This term registration was the, is basically the grandfathered withdrawals when the law was passed. Just next week, the state is going to have a public hearing where they're proposing for the first time to condition registrations during state declared droughts. Huge victory. It's really a tiny baby step. Where we're asking for more, but at least we're finally turning the corner. We're also advocating for drought legislation on Beacon Hill, which would basically say during state declared droughts, we all have to conserve water, even lower water use, even private wells. Again, we're all in this together. Water is all interrelated, groundwater, surface water, streams, it's all connected. And so this new drought legislation, which is gonna come up for public hearing, we think in September this year, could be a real game changer for us. We need to amend the, the, the rules at the state level. We're working with our legislative delegation on that. Locally is where the action is though. The last two measures, local regulations, here in New England, the cities and towns really control almost everything, including development. It's really how we condition development and how we manage our water supplies and our public water systems that really is the, the answer here. So locally, we have a lot of work to do. And then finally, it's all of you, it's all of us. Public education, we really have to stop taking water for granted, particularly when it's dry and droughty and there's not a lot of water to go around. We all have to change our behavior. We don't need to water lawns every day like we're very used to doing now. And it's not an either or proposition, it's just taking very simple measures Water once a week, but deeply. Plant your lawns in fescue as opposed to bluegrass, and you can still have green lawns during dry weather, believe it or not. But it's really gonna take all of us, and I said earlier, this solution could all happen next week if we wanted it. We are coordinators of this coalition called the Greenscapes Coalition. You probably can't see this, but the entirety of the North Shore from Swampscott to New Hampshire and West to the Andovers is part of this coalition. It's a voluntary collaboration of nonprofit organizations in our cities and towns. And we're all working at the local level to try to implement some of these changes, particularly on non-essential water use, how we manage our landscapes, 
how we manage our landscapes is the biggest problem, as I said earlier, and we're trying to change that. Our initiative also calls for changing at the state level. We're calling for three initiatives there. I mentioned earlier conditioning registrations, but we also really need to pass the drought bill and we need the state regulations to catch up with this new normal. Our regs are just simply antiquated and not up to really where the climate is headed, let alone where it is today that Dr. Young eloquently shared with us. As I said earlier, municipal action is really where it's at. We need all of you to ask your decision makers, both staff, boards, and your elected officials in cities and towns to take this seriously. As I mentioned, the last two droughts, we were close to running out of water and nobody really knew that or took it seriously. And there's a lot of room for improvement, a lot of ways to save water, a whole suite of actions here. We're calling our, it our recipe for water conservation. That simple measures at the state, excuse me, at the municipal level can make a huge difference. And then finally, as I said, it's really up to all of us. We really need to change our behavior. We're initiating what we call a lawn by lawn campaign, trying to help people to convert their landscapes to less water intensive and more drought tolerant. Again, it's a win-win situation if we could just know how to treat our lawns. We also implementing what we call this net zero policy. A lot of, when we ask cities and town officials to help and change the regulations, the first retort is often, well, what do we do about new growth and development? It's out of our control. If someone develops a new house, what, what can we do? Well, we can do a lot. We advocate for what we call net zero policy. It's literally possible to develop and use no more water. All we need to do is share the tools with developers and residents. We have to change the regulations and the planning board at the conservation commission and at the zoning board and we can literally require that new development does not tax the existing water supply it's it's not that difficult to do in certain instances you actually go net negative we just partnered with a developer in project in wenham after this development which is 60 units of new housing is built wenham will use less water than before it was built and again, there's a lot of ways to do that. We're trying to show everyone how to do that. And we're gonna really need all of us to, to help get our cities and town officials to, to implement these things. And finally, I just really wanna end with this because I know Storm Surge is such a, a great group. We've been working with them for, for many, many, many years. We're really respected. And this whole climate, issue which dr young told us is related to greenhouse gases how much energy we're using energy production is the biggest source of a greenhouse gases in the country i'm here to say water conservation is the single lowest hanging fruit to reducing our carbon footprint pumping and treating of water is the fourth largest carbon footprint in america it uses massive amounts of electricity and chemicals and water conservation is free. I mentioned half of the water we use is wasted on lawns every summer. Fourth largest source of carbon footprint. If we could just conserve half of our water, which is easily done, we could make a tremendous impact on the climate all at no cost. So water is a little underappreciated, but we're here to, to get everyone thinking about water. And all of this is local. And we could change this, as I said earlier, um, you know, tomorrow with the proper rules and regulations and, you know, we're, we're advocating. It's a real positive measure. It's one of the things we can all do and one of the simplest things we can all do to, to change the climate crisis. And with that, I will thank you and happy to answer questions with, I think, everybody on the panel. Thanks. Um, I'm John Eric White. I'm a city engineer. And I am up here representing the city, but by all means, um, there are many of us behind the scenes that are doing all kinds of work. Good? Okay. Um, great job, Dr. Young and, uh, and Wayne. Um, and it's too bad we couldn't see um, Dr. Young's drone shots, but I saw him previously on some, uh, some emails. And if you all have a chance to see him, it's, it's uh, fantastic work. Um, we have a assistant engineer that we have a drone 
Um, nothing to his uh, expertise, but we also, we, we do use it for watershed protection. I just sent him out, his, Nick's, his name is Nick Federico. He's our assistant engineer, uh, doing a great job. Good job, Nick. Um, I sent him out today, he droned the artichoke reservoir and we're trying to get a, you know, a, a consistent um, set of drone shots so we can see a progression of any algae bloom. He went out twice this year, didn't see anything. With today's heat, uh, we're crossing our fingers. Hopefully it'll be uh, all clear, clear water and not, not, uh, not bright green. Um, as far as Wayne's presentation, what I, uh, what I took out of that is the first thing I'm gonna do tomorrow is give him a call. Um, I did not realize that a lot of his work is as active on watershed protection for at the state level, I know he's always doing it. I didn't know those specific things that were happening this this uh, this season. Um, currently, uh, the city we're so busy with our own watershed protection. We have a, a, a presentation this in, in in August. I'll present, give you an update on that. Uh, but in summary, we're so busy locally on watershed protection. We're hiring um, attorneys. Uh, we have our own internal staff. Tom Kuzik is our water water plan operator. He and I are, are spearheading this with our consultant Tyan Bond. What I want to do is um, uh, tap into Wayne's work for watershed protection because a lot of our watershed is in West Newbury. And the town of West Newbury, we've been meeting, meeting with them for years. Um, they are more than willing to help with the watershed protection, but they're very short-handed. And we have the bandwidth, they don't. So they're willing to, to produce a watershed protection plan, turn it into a bylaw for them, uh, and move forward. Um, so I'm gonna tap into some of the work he, that he's been doing and grab the conservation methods. Um, and it's, it's, it's also, I wanna restrict development, but that's a different story. They do a good job on restricting development because it's like two or two and a half acres zoning over there, something like that. But that's my comment for, uh, nice job guys. Oh, you Bill? Sure, sure. Uh, um, first of all, great GIS work okay. and all that. Uh, I'm just going to point out that those, uh, first of all, are all mean higher high water. Those are the plottings. Don't forget, if you think, if you look at this thing and you say, oh, my house is outside of it, we got storm surge on top of that, too. So you're not safe. Um, mm -hmm. Hurricanes, nor'easters, whatever. Um, and uh, let's see. Let's see. Also, um, I, I think I might just, just let people know, I'm not sure, I just found this out myself. I, I have uh, a lot of flooding background, but uh, flood rate setting, I'm just gonna let you know, uh, is about to change on its plan right now for October 1st, and they're gonna use a whole new set of criteria for setting your rates. Um, um, I, I won't get into it, but you could look it up, and it's called FEMA Risk 2.0. Um, and uh, another thing that was touched upon, you mentioned, you, we talked about sea level rise, we talked about droughts, um, we talked about temperatures, but uh, another aspect of what we're going through year after year, rainfall intensities are going way up. So uh, floods in general are, are getting worse. Your, your local floodplain is expanding and that's without sea level rise in there um, so a, a lot of gloom and doom and just the one other comment I think we should um, you know we talk about a lot of technical stuff but we should probably touch on what are some of the other solutions to uh, global emissions that we could do personally um, you talked about as, as far as water pumping but some of the other stuff you know uh, Maybe, maybe everybody just knows this, you know, driving less, uh, maybe less consumption, um, a little more consideration of your packages are being shipped all around the world and all that stuff. And I don't know if, if yeah, uh, I think we ought, we ought to all be thinking of our, our contributions. It isn't all just somebody else uh, that's going to solve this. So that's it for me. Like, yeah. So my question was, why is New England and the Gulf of Maine warming more 
quickly than other parts of the world? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the Gulf of Maine, but a little bit of it's, it's fairly shallow relative to other bodies and, and some of the, some of the, the currents, but the, the land, partly it's because of our latitude. Uh, higher latitudes are warming faster than lower latitudes. Uh, remember, I showed how the how um, minimum temperatures tend to be tend to be changing faster than than high temperatures. So parts of the world that have minimum temperatures tend to be warming faster than than the others. So that's part of it. And I don't know if there if there's if there's if there's any other reasons in particular for New England, but latitude is a big big aspect. Yeah. Good evening. Hmm. Um, great talks. Wayne and Dr. Young, thanks very much. It was great uh, information. Um, sort of relative to that question about why is Gulf of Maine warming faster than other oceans, the main reason is a change in the path of the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is tending to come closer to the East Coast, whereas historically it veered further to the East. And there's also less slope water coming down from the uh, Scotian Shelf in the Labrador curtain current. So that's the main reason okay. that oh, means for me. Um, relative to Wayne's comment regarding um, net zero water consumption for new development or even net zero or net negative, I was wondering if you could articulate on some of the measures that new developments could actually take to achieve that. I mean most people assume that all buildings, all homes are going to require some water. And so it'd be really interesting to hear some of your thoughts about how you can get to net negative. That's pretty, pretty yeah, amazing. Get, get a little specific, Mike. Um, can you guys hear me? Um, it involves two simple concepts. First of all, you minimize the amount of water to begin with. So ultra-efficient fixtures, smallish lawns, planting native drought tolerant plants, no irrigation systems. So you basically get to the, the minimum water use, to, that's your starting point. And then the second step is you offset the rest. We all need water every day, so that, that per gallon per day, you, it's pretty easy to get down to about 20 to 30 gallons per person per day. Then what you do is the develop, require the developer to pay a fee into what's called a water bank. And that fee builds up and allows the municipality to save water elsewhere, fixing pipes, offering rebates, offer incentives to redevelop. And that's how you can grow without using any more water. And to go negative, you just do more of that. Um, for example, use rainwater for toilet flushing. You get pretty radical. Make sure all of the water infiltrates into the groundwater, doesn't run off your property at all and have a slightly higher fee to save water elsewhere in the town. So those measures are basically how it's done. We regulate all new development, uh, so this really wouldn't be you know, that onerous compared to all the things we currently ask developers. Thank you, Wayne. To follow up on that question, is Greenscapes putting together anything comprehensive that can be shared throughout the Commonwealth and the country about those specific action items that can be taken? Because we're, collaboration we're, is so important. Yeah, you know, we're developing those regionally, and that's a big enough battle. We haven't really expanded beyond the, the, the 28 cities and towns on the North Shore. But these concepts are ubiquitous. They apply anywhere. We have, we have a lot of educational programs. And really changing behavior is, is more than just education, though. So that's really the next step, is to get more of these things implemented. So thank you very much for reaching out to the community. I'd like to know how you are approaching the municipalities and engaging them in the process of adapting these um, bylaws and ordinances that you suggested in your conversation. Referring to water yep. use? Yep. Um, so as part of our outreach, we're act and the whole Pi Rivers Partnership, Parker, Ipswich, Essex Partnership that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is all about engaging municipal officials. We have 28 members that are cooperating with us, and it's really just working individually at the local board level to get bylaws changed, get bylaws reviewed. It's a it's a, it's a big big job, but we're slowly getting traction. And you know, with the, the big um, news of the droughts of the last five years, people are paying much more attention. Um, you know, as John Eric said, 
municipal officials have their hands pretty full, so it, it's pretty hard to get the bandwidth, but um, it, it's, it's changing and change is starting to happen. It's, it's starting to snowball. So I am a municipal land use official, and what I would like to know is how are you coming to my office and saying, we'd like to work with you to update your bylaws? Because so far no one's been knocking at my door. That knock is coming in the next few days. Okay. We, we actually okay. just <laughs> we just um, announced a big initiative throughout the Greenscapes Coalition this summer and fall to up, try to update all um, land use regulations in all 28 towns. So that knock's on its way imminently. All right, you promise. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Young, we had provided this handout, and yep. I hoped you could take just a moment to explain the legend. Sure. And I'll hand you one if you would like to hand it. That's okay. So, so in, in, in the legend, um, the, the first one, the light blue, is, is the, the mean higher high tide, right? There's two high tides a day, two low, high, two low tides a day, the one that's a little bit higher. And, and that's from the point which we will measure future sea level rise from it's gonna, gonna potentially affect the land, flood over the land. The next one, I put 2030, that, that, that study, there's a study that was done in Boston about potential sea level rise. They estimated that it was for the, uh, that, uh, that uh, it would be, I think it's 0.73 meters maybe, there, whatever, the, whatever it is. Um, so that is just, it's not storm activity or anything. It's just what we expect the sea to rise. And so at, at higher high tide uh, in 2030, you're going to expect that area to be, to be covered in, uh, from the blue. And then from that color, the next level is 2050. So that is the level that, that uh, has, been, has been modeled and expected. And the next color shows where that advance is going to go to. And then the next, then 2070. Uh, same thing, no storm activity, just what we expect the, the, uh, on a calm day at the higher high tide. That will be, that will be the area that gets, gets flooded. And then 2100 is, is high tide expected plus some storm activity uh, that we expect to be happening at that point in time. So that's kind of more. And, and the 2100, we could get a storm like Sandy and it would, it would, it would flood all that area that's in red um, if, if it was to hit this area. I think what's really uh, fascinating about this, we're, we're always concerned about the erosion that's occurring on, on the, uh, the shore of uh, Plum Island. But I think what this really shows you is the real concern is the flooding on the, on the marsh side. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to have the daily flooding uh, in, in the fairly near future. And uh, there's a lot more houses that are in jeopardy there than the houses on the on the front of the island. Right. Right. And we have to find places where the marsh can 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 migrate to keep to keep uh, producing the food for the for the ocean for the for the food chain. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I, I, I uh, earlier this year I did some king tide uh, uh, droning, and the higher tides were or the higher uh, king tides were at night, not in the day. And I would come and I'd drive and there would be puddles in the middle of the road in places um, where already uh, we're seeing, uh, seeing some of this flooding that's occurring once or twice a year. Sunny day or moon day uh, uh, flooding. And I think actually what we're seeing there is fresh water that is, that is floating on the... Sure, sure, the, it's, sure. It's, when, it's when, when in the estuary when the yeah. fresh water and the seawater come. Yeah. But, it, but it's the ocean that's pushing that fresh water up. Yeah, yeah. But you, yeah. You'll, you'll see that right in the center of, of Plum Island. And it's the salt oh, yeah. water, that, that the, yeah. the fresh water is floating. There's a lens of it floating right. on the yeah, right. salt water. Pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. You mentioned that you were, there was some legislation changes happening next week. There was some... Can you just expand a little bit on that? And also, how can we lobby our uh, elected officials to say that we would support these um, changes that are hopefully going through at the state level and the local level? Yeah, um, keep, keep tabs on our website. It's, it's all happening really quickly. So the big thing is July 7th, the state, it's actually DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection is proposing a regulation change. It doesn't even need legislation. It's just an internal regulation change 
to put conditions to require water conservation during declared droughts for these exempt water withdrawals. And so the public hearing is next Wednesday. There's another one on the 26th, I believe. And the public comment period ends at the end of July, July 29th. So every one of us can draft a letter to the DEP in favor of this very important change. And so if you go on our website, there'll be all kinds of information. We'll be trying to get the word out across the Commonwealth through our partners. And so um, writing a letter, one sentence, and submitting it electronically to DEP by the end of July um, would go a long way. Wayne, Wayne. Uh, what, what's oh. your email address? What's your website? Um, IpswichRural, one word, dot org. And Wayne, do you have a uh, template on your website for a suggestion? We, we, we will. That, that'll yeah. be out by um, first of next week. Yep, thank you. Are we in a level of drought right now? Right now, no. We were in a level one drought in April but the Northeast came out of the drought in May with the good rains we had in May. Um, the drought task force is meeting next week to reconsider. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we're headed that way, if, it, if we don't get significant rains, but cross our fingers, we're, we're about average right now so far, so, so far so good. Good, and John Eric, does Newburyport have specific, um, I, I think when you mentioned Newburyport has some contingency plans when we go into drought mm -hmm. on, yep. the, on the books. Could you speak to those, John, um, a little bit? I don't yes. Know if I mean, I'm aware of them. I'm not the water plant operator, so I don't know. I don't have the numbers memorized. But in, in general, it's so many inches below the spillway. And when we, when you, when we reach a certain number, uh, a certain depth and certain loss of uh, the, the surface water, um, then we trigger the bands. You know, the first is a voluntary, and then it goes on from there. I will say, we all need to, um, you, all you guys keep need to push it, keep, you, you, you still have to push the municipalities and all of us officials because um, our current chart is about 25 years old. It's outdated. So right now when we have, say, 12 inches below, to me, I think we need to raise the bar a little bit and be a little bit more conservation aware um, on, 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 on the numbers that we have. So I'll work with um, Tom, Tom on that, but that's above my position, but I can, I'm the catalyst. The Water Commission gets involved with that. Well, first, I would love, I'd like to thank you. This was a wonderful evening. So much incredible information. Um, where you, you see our team of people videotaping this session, uh, it's a chance and an opportunity for us to go back and think about and hear again some of the things you said and think about them um, more thoroughly. We are going to send the slideshows tomorrow. Now I'm talking to them for a second. We're going to send the slideshows tomorrow so folks can look at the great drone uh, photos that Dr. Young um, took, some of the uh, policy ideas from Wayne's presentation are going to be in that, um, that full deck, so get a chance to see those. Um, John Eric is coming back in July to talk specifically about action steps in the resiliency plan to secure our water. Um, so, right? Yeah, still coming? That is correct, yep. Okay, great. Looking forward to it. Yes. It, it's gonna be a long one. <laughs> okay, okay, get, get, bring your bug spray. Um, thank you so much for attending. It's great to have this many people here on a hot night. We were like, ugh, ugh, you know, but we wanted to proceed because we knew we had a great meeting of the minds happening this evening. Um, so if you have questions for members of Storm Surge, stormsurge9 at gmail.com, I'll mention we have a new website that our team put together last month. And so we're really going to try to make sure a lot of what came out of these presentations is available to you there and more. So a great place to reach us at our website. Did I forget anything, anyone? Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thanks, guys.